My name is John Lobel, and this is a sketch for a talk on visionary creativity, subject of my new book. One of our themes for today is creativity. I want to talk about a particular kind of creativity, visionary creativity. It's the kind of creativity that brings us new worlds. It's the subject of my new book, Visionary Creativity. And we're going to sort of take a view from 35,000 feet. So let's look at the very large context for our creativity. And I'm going to say that visionary creatives are those who swim in the culture of our day and the things they create in art, design, fashion, science, technology, business, embody our culture, and at the same time, pull us into the future. Visionary creativity takes place within a cultural context. Now, what do we mean by culture? Culture is the stage on which we live our lives and manifest our creativity. Imagine a Baroque painting or a Beethoven symphony of churning clouds. And these clouds swirl and then coalesce and crystallize into buildings, novels, works of art. Those are objects of culture. So that's going to be our approach to culture. We're going to look at several major different cultural periods. We'll start with the Renaissance, which brought us a linear logical world and Newtonian space-time and causality. So Newton set the stage on which Renaissance culture takes place, a clockwork universe of infinite space and time, a uniform space that sort of put a grid over the world. And we see that grid in the perspective painting of the Renaissance. And then within that culture emerged the individual as a body, mind, and soul. And here we see in Michelangelo's David an inner psychological character. And here in Raphael's School of Athens, we see Plato and Aristotle in the center, and then surrounded by great poets, philosophers, scientists, mathematicians, artists, all of which come together to make the Renaissance person. So that's sort of the Renaissance vision of a human being and then a home for that human being. Here's Palladio's Villa Rotunda, which creates a central space from which the human being can look out and dominate, understand, control the landscape. In the 19th century, we enter a world of electrified flux, Maxwell's electromagnetic fields. And so James Clark Maxwell brought us a vision that all is fields, light, electromagnetism, even matter, is all fluctuating electromagnetic fields. And we see this manifest in the arts, for example, in Vincent van Gogh's Starry Night, in which each of the stars is a swirling center of energy. The cypress tree is flames licking the sky. All is electrified and energized. And in architecture, a transparency of flux and flow between the earth and the sky. In the 20th century, modernism brings us a loss of all fixed frames of reference, as we see, for example, in Einstein's relativity. And Einstein shows that these electromagnetic fields, well, where are they propagating? And we thought perhaps in Newton's grid of uniform space and time. But Einstein shows there is no grid. Well, then, what is our reference? Against what do we measure, see, understand ourselves? And the answer is nothing. It's all built on sand. And space and time itself are collapsing and dynamic. We see this in Picasso's Cubism here, Portrait for Villard, in which the subject, Villard, is shattered like a mirror, shattered upon the floor with fragmented images. And the viewer in constant motion. There is no fixed point of view. Time itself is in flux, as we see in Salvador Dali's melting watches in his painting Persistence of Memory. And then in the novel, Proust, his frame of reference is 
the flux of his own memory that comes flowing back when he tastes the Madeleine. And James Joyce and Finnegan's Wake creates this entire world of all within the self, all within one's own stream of consciousness, of levels of familiar, historic, legendary, mythological, of the Viconian cycles of animism, aristocracy, democracy, anarchy, and recycling, all of this flux within one's own self. And in our architecture, a flow between the inside and the outside, a flow through the architecture, no fixed center, no point of view, but continual flux, as we see in Frank Lloyd Wright's Falling Water. But much of this was a hundred years ago. What about today? Where are we today? And I'm going to suggest that today we're in a world of interconnected fractal networks computationally generating themselves. Wow. What does that mean? Let's start with Watson and Crick's genomics. So in 1953, Watson and Crick decode DNA, one of the great scientific achievements of all time. They find that there are four letters, adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine, A, T, G, and C, and two rules. A and T can link, G and C can link. An alphabet of four letters, two rules, and suddenly the code of all of life. Now, how complicated a world can four letters generate? Well, all of life, but you even see this in an inanimate world. So here's a simple formula. I was told there'd be no mathematics. <laughs> but you have this simple formula. just want to show you how simple it is on the left. Generating what's called a Mandelbrot set. So here's this figure. We have to generate it in the computer. And let's zoom in on it. And so we zoom in and we see, oh, there's a lot of stuff going in there. And we zoom in more. And it looks like there are other little Mandelbrot sets in there. Whole swirling worlds zoom in more. And the point is, we can zoom in infinitely. That little equation generates literally an infinite world of complexity. Little dot in there, let's go look in that, and the whole of the worlds keep illuminating. Let's think about how that might apply to us. The human genome is 23,000 genes in us, that DNA we just saw. But we now understand that there's also bacteria living in us. That's why we eat yogurt and take uh, probiotics to keep that healthy. So, yes, we have 23,000 human genes, but another million plus bacterial genes as part of us. This is a diagram of where all this is living in us and around us. And we're blowing it all over the room, interchanging it. Lynn Margulies uh, challenges Darwin's notion of natural selection to bring about evolution and suggests instead that evolution takes place through this exchange of genetics being blown around. Life did not take over the globe by combat, but by networking, says Lynn Margulies and her son, Dorian Sagan. So we are not distinct, discrete species, but this network of interconnection. Think of everything we do with this interconnection. Facebook, anybody? How might we think about it? Here's Surratt's painting, Sunday in the Park. The figures look like us. Very classical, distinct, differentiated. But then if we zoom in and zoom in, we find all is fluctuating dots. The world and we are clusters of interconnected fractal networks computationally generating themselves. One of the great scientists, mathematicians of our time, Stephen Wolfram, says, I think when I find the code, sort of the DNA of the universe, that generates our universe, it'll be just six lines. Very simple lines of code can generate the entire world. We're not in Kansas anymore. Totally new ways of thinking. So one of my colleagues, Rush Lavani, lives in a 27-dimensional universe of the morphological genome, the set of rules that generate all form. Here's the universe in the center through which he navigates. Here's some form that he's generating. Another of my colleagues, Carl Shu, 
gives his students three genes, A, B, and C. By the end of the semester, the building has grown itself. So we might ask, if you were going to make an oak tree, you would not take a telephone pole, nail some sticks to it, and glue leaves onto it. You would stick an acorn in the ground and let the oak tree make itself. The acorn has a set of rules, DNA, that can make an oak tree. Soon we'll be making everything that way. Here's continuum fashion shoes, 3D printed from a set of rules. I began by saying visionary creatives swim in the culture of our day. So ask yourself, what in your field, in your culture, is obvious to everyone else but does not seem quite right to you? And if you think that way, whole new worlds might open up. At the end of the great exhibit of Alexander McQueen's fashion at the Metropolitan Museum was this quote on the wall. This is the birth of a new dawn. There is no way back for me now. I am going to take you on journeys you've never dreamed were possible. Maybe all of us can start to think that way. So, is it time for visions to be born in you? Is it time for you to begin building our world anew? Is it time for you to make of your life an outrageous work of art to set yourself ablaze? Thank you.